sadly not one of those people who has some cool school ground story where they sold something and made a ton of money when they were like 12 and they were on that entrepreneurial journey forever. But I was fortunate enough to meet some people and to have some very good friends who worked in tech and kind of opened my eyes to a totally different type of career and job and, and way of actually just, I, spent, I suppose, spending your time. Hi, I'm Cameron Peek. Uh, welcome back to The Rest of Perspective, a show about female CEOs and the paths they took to get to their positions. And I'm incredibly excited today to have Natasha Vernier on the, on the show. Um, she is the founder and CEO of Cable. Welcome, Natasha. Hi, Cameron. Thank you for having me. Well, I'd love to get started and, and quickly just give a, a background about what Cable is, what you're doing, um, and then would love to get a little bit more into your journey after that. For sure, yeah. Cable is uh, the all-in-one platform to help banks understand how effective their financial crime controls are. Um, and we provide a platform that helps banks that work as banking as a service banks or partner banks collaborate with their fintech programs to automate things like onboarding and the ongoing communication and collaboration that they have to do. And what, what led you to start the company? <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, so in my previous life, I was head of financial crime at Monzo Bank in the UK, which was one of the first challenger banks there in the UK. And we, we got a full banking license. And the job that I had there was to run the team that built all of the financial crime controls. So we built things like the customer onboarding journey, the identity verification, the know your customer checks, transaction monitoring, all of those sorts of things. And half of the team that I led ha uh, were engineers and data scientists, and we spent millions on technology. So we thought we were pretty good at this, and we had lots of technology to help us do our job. But there's an, another regulatory requirement that banks have in the UK and the US and many other countries, which is to test if those controls are working and to do so independently. And so there was another team at Monzo whose job was to do that, was to test the controls that we built. And that team had no engineers and no data scientists, and they had no technology they could have bought. And that's true for really every single bank around the world today. Um, and so when I left Monzo with my co-founder, Katie, uh, we decided to explore whether we could automate that, whether we could automate the effectiveness testing of financial crime controls with the ultimate goal of trying to reduce financial crime in the world. Awesome. And did you have you always wanted to be an entrepreneur? Was that a burning desire from when you were young or what what led you to to start a company yeah not really I I'm sadly not one of those people who has some cool school ground story where they sold something and made a ton of money when they were like 12 and they were on that entrepreneurial journey forever that wasn't me um I'm afraid I had I suppose I was on a much more uh, typical path before that I went and studied law and then I became an accountant and I was very much I sort of sort of focused on getting a vocational degree and having a, a stable job. Both of my parents were in medicine and that was a lot of sort of the, the conversation around the table that we used to have. Uh, but I was fortunate enough to meet some people and to have some very good friends who worked in tech and kind of opened my eyes to a totally different type of career and job and, and way of actually just, I, spent, I suppose, spending your time. And it wasn't, I guess, until I was in my early 20s that I realized that there was an opportunity to do something more entrepreneurial like that. I never really think of myself as an entrepreneur, though. I don't know that I like that word. I, it feels, feels, like, uh, feels like I'm calling myself something that I haven't yet achieved, I suppose. <laughs> well, you know, you're, you're introducing groundbreaking new products to, to, to banks and financial institutions that are you know, improving the way they do business. That sounds pretty entrepreneurial to me. Um. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. It, uh, it, it, to me, it sort of implies that it's been done a number of times and I've proved that that is what I am, which uh, is certainly <laughs> not the case yet. <laughs> um, and so what, what, what made you decide, though, that this was, this was what you wanted to jump into? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of ways to take your knowledge and kind of expand them to the market. Um, why, did, why did you decide to, to jump in and, and be at the helm of a company doing it? Yeah, I, I spent my time at Monzo. I went on a bit of a roller coaster there. When I joined Monzo, I, it was just so very different from the uh, financial services world that I'd come from. Um, it was amazing. I was so excited by all of the, the speed that we were doing things at and 
the responsibility that everybody in the company had. And I initially was like, oh, I'm definitely going to do something like this. I'll definitely start a business myself. This seems awesome. And I think I probably spent some time trying to force that a little bit and trying to come up with these amazing, innovative ideas. And then I saw the journey that the uh, the Monzo CEO and co-founder Tom Blomfield took. And um, he's talked about it publicly. It became very stressed. It was a very difficult job. I think that was probably significantly heightened by running a regulated bank, um, which brings its own uh, series of challenges. And so at the, sort of halfway through my Monzo journey, I decided that I would never want to start a company. And this looked like a terrible idea and a terrible life. Um, and then I then I got to the end of my Monzo journey and I actually had an insight as to something that was needed. I you know I had been working in financial crime for a, for four and a half years and I was doing this thing and I saw this big gaping hole. There was such a such automation around financial crime controls, but absolutely nothing around the testing of those controls, which is a requirement. And in almost every other area of our life, there are controls and there are alerts and there are indicators so that we know that controls work. And the, the way that I like to explain this is like when you're driving your car, there are lights that tell you if you're out of oil or if your brakes are not working. And those are testing of controls that are in place. I, I, this is just a common thing. But in a huge area of banking, an area of banking that costs banks millions, sometimes billions of dollars a year to try to, to meet the controls, to try to do this effectively, there is no testing of these controls. It was such a blindingly obvious gap to me. And I did have the experience and it was a, a sort of now or never situation. My wife was pregnant and uh, I knew that it would get harder and harder to become a founder and to take the pay cut and to pour everything I had into that if I waited. So it was a really, a really a timing thing. I'd had the idea there was a, an opportunity that I knew something about and it was a bit now or never. I love it. So there's, um, there's this pull that was almost bigger than you or bigger than kind of the principles that you had going into it um, that that kind of pulled you into it, it sounds like. I definitely felt like if I was going to try to start a company, then it had to be something that had a big enough mission that I truly did feel like I could spend 10 or 20 years working on it. Um, I, I didn't want to go and try to get money from people and actually two or three years in decide that I wasn't interested in doing it. Like the, the idea may not work and we might not be able to achieve it, but I didn't want to feel like I was bored of it or I wanted to step away very quickly. And it felt like with the idea for Cable, our mission is to reduce financial crime. That is such a vast mission and financial crime impacts so many people in ways that people don't really understand. Um, I felt like it was something that I really could be interested in for 10, 20 plus years. And so I guess that was the other part of it that was the bigger pull that you talk about. I was running a company and had a kid during the process, but didn't have one at the same point at which I was contemplating starting it. Like, how did you, what was going through your head then? How did you kind of, you know, build up the courage, not only to start a company, but do it knowing that there was another human coming (laughs) It was probably a, just a huge mix of naivety and stupidity, honestly. Um, it was, uh, I, I was lucky in that I'm married to a woman um, and I was not the, the pregnant mom. So uh, my wife was pregnant and that obviously uh, made things significantly different for me as a female founder. I was not going to need the, the physical recovery time that my wife needed. And that was that was a huge advantage that I had. I also have a very, very supportive wife. And I think that... Um, I often talk about how the other halves of founders really should get equity in their partner's businesses because I love that so idea. much of what we do at Cable is only because Stephanie, my wife, um, gives me the freedom and the space and um, is endlessly patient uh, with the things that I need to be doing. So I try to do, I try to do a lot of the childcare. We now have two children. Um, I try to be as present as I can be and we're fully remote. So I get to have lunch with them and dinner with them and all those things are great. But certainly if anything has to drop, it's always Stephanie's priorities that drop because I have to run the business. And she is very, very, very understanding about that. And at some point in the future, the tables will turn and it'll be my turn to prioritize her completely. What as you made that that jump from Monzo, kind of decided to start your own company, what were some of the the tactics that you used to have those in place? Like, were you building before you left? Um, I mean, you clearly had the idea, but what, what, what did you have in place that gave you kind of the courage to, to jump? Um, and then would love to get into some of the, those early 
early tactics you employed after that? Yeah, we had not built anything when I left. Um, I, I did have a safeguard in place. I had some good friends who run a financial crime consulting business. And I knew that if I was leaving Monzo, I, I couldn't not have a salary because my wife was pregnant and we were renting a house in London and we had you know all of our outgoings. And so I joined my friend's consulting firm um, for about three months and I was predominantly writing the business plan and speaking to customers for cable, but I also did a little bit of work with them. Um, they then have a, a small share in cable, which is kind of how that played out in terms of they knew that they were basically paying me to explore this idea um, and they were very supportive. So that was kind of the safety net that I put in place. A little bit different, I suppose, from other founders, partly because I'm not technical and I can't build, I couldn't, I could not build the, the MVP myself. Um, that was the the safety net I put in place. But what I think is is maybe interesting to talk about is how I had a conversation with Local Globe about the needs that I had regarding salary straight off the bat. Um, because we only raised, we raised £675,000, something like 750000 USD uh, in that pre-seed round. But I was very clear with Remus, the partner at Local Globe, that I simply could not take a 30 or 40k salary. I'm the only income in my family. Um, I, we were renting a house in London. We were having a baby. I just needed more money. And I was very clear about the money that I did need. I was taking a significant pay cut from when I left Monzo. But I said, you know, I just need... I think at the time it was £70,000. I just need this money, otherwise I won't be able to pay my rent and I won't be able to afford to, you know, look after look after the baby. Um, and they were very, very supportive of that. There was not even a question or a, you know, a little bit of back and forth. It was totally understand your need and that makes total sense. So you take what you need. It sounds like you had, um, I mean, both then and I think through today, very supportive investors. How have you thought about curating your cap table, how you found that right sort of alignment there? What's what's worked for you? The first is the so the the VC investors specifically. Yeah, I think I've been hugely lucky. I have spent quite a lot of time getting to know them. Um, with the latest VCs who invested in our Series A, I actually knew both Stage 2 and Jump Capital for about a year before I took money from them. And um, one of the one of the best things and the, one of the reasons I knew stage two were was so well aligned with what we were doing at Cable is that we have what we call our operating system, uh, which you can find on our website. And it's a real it's a it's a full document that explains how we want to build Cable and the things that matter to us. And during the fundraising process, the investors, the partners at stage two, Dan and Liz, they actually wrote their own personal operating system and shared it with me. And it was a really nice moment where they clearly understood that maybe at Cable we were doing things a little bit differently than other companies of our stage in terms of our culture and how we're being very proactive with it today. And they wanted to make sure that I understood that they really supported that. That was something that they were not going to fight as we move forward, but also that they could really relate to it and they felt like it was valuable and they shared their own operating system with us, which uh, was, re was really, really cool. One of the most helpful things has been the angel investors that I've managed to to include on our cap table and therefore learn from. Um, so when we did the first pre-seed round, we had, I think it was eight angel investors and they were all very experienced business people and they, they were fantastic. They were eight white men. And so going into our seed round, I decided that um, we needed a lot more diversity on our cap table. I had never raised money before. They were offering me money and I said yes. And I didn't really put any thought at all into the makeup of my cap table. So Fast forward, we were raising the seed round and well before we even decided to raise the seed, I had started having conversations with potential angel investors because I knew I wanted to make the cap table as close to 50-50 male-female as I could, but also much more diverse in terms of sexual orientation and nationality and so on. Um, when we raised that seed round, we managed to, to achieve that. We were at that point 52% female in terms of the amount of money raised, but also the number of investors that we had. Um, and we had a pretty good diversity split across the other areas that we were interested in in improving. We managed to achieve the same thing with our Series A. So we're currently 51% male and 49% female, and we've got 10% you know, of our cap table identifies as LGBTQ+. Um, and the, the other aspect of getting a diverse cap table was actually getting people who had been on this journey before. So 
uh, one of my one of my angel investors, Thompson, um, he had started a couple of companies before. So when I was going through my Series A, I had received a couple of term sheets. I just spent an hour on the phone with him and he was talking me through how he'd approach some of these uh, negotiation points and the things that he'd seen. Um, and uh, one of my other angel investors is the co-founder of Alloy, and she had raised a lot of money um, and had been needing those investments at Alloy. And so she was able to give me some advice on things to look out for. So in terms of in terms of advice for other female CEOs looking to raise money, I think my biggest piece of advice is just to ask other people because you're not supposed to know how to do this. And like, there's no way to know how to do this unless you just talk to people. Um, I've tried to read books about it, but there's nothing really that's like guidance on how to actually raise your first fundraising rounds. And And things change so quickly too, that I also feel like you need people that are kind of in it because books can become stale as a different instrument becomes more trendy or the market dictates something else. So I definitely agree with that, that piece of advice. Um, you know, I think a lot of people kind of to your first round, just go out, kind of see what they can raise. Maybe they'll ask about the best terms or something else, but having such a principled approach around balance and diversity seems like kind of beget more people that appreciated that worldview and probably helped differentiate you a little bit. I think it's very aligned to just the culture and the way my co-founder Katie and I are. I am I am the same person at Cable as I am at home. I do not have the ability to bring somebody different to work and then have somebody else at home. I'm I do not have two sides to me. I'm not very good at hiding my emotions or my feelings and I will just you know, I will give my all to cable and at home and, you know, I have to find a way to balance those two things. I'm not good at compartmentalizing. And that just means that like you you get what you see. And so I'm not going to go into a fundraising process trying to be manipulative or um, I, I just can't do it. It's just not me. And if I were to try to do that, I would probably be way less successful at actually raising money. And so I find the the whole fundraising ecosystem kind of bizarre. And I find it very stressful that these individuals have given me what to a lot of them is like a considerable amount of money. And I feel a huge responsibility to get that money back to them. And so I don't, it's not likely that I take money from people and think that we can go spend it in frivolous ways. I I think about it almost every day. I feel a huge responsibility to actually return this money to them. And therefore I want to be able to to speak to people honestly. I want to be able to tell them when things are going badly or things are going well. And I don't want to be having to to manage the politics of the situation. I would be a terrible politician. Um, and I, I don't want to have to try to bring that into my business. So I, yes, we we do things in a very principled way at Cable. But I think that's just because that's who Katie and I are. That's great. Um, maybe building on that, I, I, I would actually love to go deeper on your operating principles. I mean, I've looked at them and I think one, they're great. Um, and what I appreciated about them was as we, you know, we did the same thing at Aslo and we got to a similar point, but it was over like five different iterations of kind of seeing what worked and didn't to have kind of more examples as part of it. And so I think what'd be helpful is maybe just to walk through that framework kind of why you set it up the way that you did um, and just how it's been successful. So other founders may contemplate doing something like that. Yeah, I guess as a bit of background. So the the operating system, we have five principles. Um, they are be kind, make transparent decisions, communicate clearly, aim to improve and empower through responsibility. And when we wrote this, we actually came up with four of those five uh, right at the beginning of 2021 with our earliest team. Um, we replaced one of them with empower to empower uh, through responsibility in probably beginning of 2022. And the first time we wrote it, we came up with um, the ways to help people actually live those principles. So in our operating system, it says things like why we are kind, how we are kind, being kind is not, and ways we want to help people be kind. And we really lay it out like that. Um, and that was really important because if you have a principle like be kind, it becomes very easy to hide behind that and avoid difficult conversations, avoid giving feedback, moving too slowly, all of those things. And we do not believe that our principle of be kind is at all um, counter to moving quickly and being effective and efficient. You just have to be clear what you mean when you say 
we want everybody to be kind and that's something that we hold them up to. So literally written in our operating system, it says being kind is not avoiding having tough conversations or avoiding challenging assumptions or opinions. The ways that we are kind is that we are generous and helpful and think about other people's feelings. We assume good intent. If we disagree, we disagree and commit. We never say, I told you so. And so we're really trying to provide people with not only the list of things that really matter to us and that we want to see them doing in their day-to-day -day life, but also it's unfair to give them that list and not tell them what it means or how to do it. And so we're trying to help them actually succeed with our operating system principles. I think that's great. I mean, and I, I think you had some amazing foresight. I mean, we had a similar one, which was empathy. And we definitely found people backing off from hard conversations. And then we had another, which was um, no bullshit, which was basically transparency. And we saw that weaponized around being super kind of rude and direct up front. And so we backed into the what these are not or how you need to pair them. Um, and so I think it's just amazing foresight to do that from the from the beginning. I think this is um, probably the result of the just the interesting collaboration between me and Katie, my co-founder. So we are polar opposite people. And it means that we we oftentimes end up with um, a good idea that is very well implemented. And so I have some ideas. I am running forward. I am saying this is where we're heading and this is the vision and this is the kind of thing we want. And then Katie is very, very good at making sure that we implement it in a way that everybody can actually utilize that has a lot of process around um, the right amount of process for where we are, but has enough process. Um, so it's a it's an interesting balance. And I think it's the combination of the ways that Katie and I think and think very differently. That's great. Um, one thing I'd love to touch on is is just your role as a LGBTQ leader. Um, I mean, this podcast is, you know, principally devoted to profiling female CEOs, but I also would love to just give you a, a, a platform um, to comment, inspire, kind of speak to that, that audience as well. Yeah. I, I find it, um, I find it very weird being any kind of sort of spokesperson or like trying to, to provide inspiration to such a wide range of people. I think that all that I can do is be unashamed of who I am and talk about it loudly and hope that that in, it, in itself helps people. So I often talk about the fact that I have a wife and that I'm a lesbian and that I'm a, a female founder and all of those things. And I'm happy to talk about them on stage and on LinkedIn. And my my only hope there is that other people see it and see that there are there are lesbians running businesses who are happy about it and who are so far succeeding although there's a long way to go and that that can inspire other people to to think that they can do the same things and when I was young I knew nobody who was gay um, but also as I was thinking about business and what I wanted to do I had no real um, gay uh, role models or people that I could see and say, oh, I might want to run a company one day, or I might want to work in this industry one day. And I know that that person also does. So all that I hope is that by me talking about it, which probably annoys people who are not gay um, a fair bit, but the more that I talk about it, because I'm not ashamed of it, and I think it's important, the more people will see it and maybe see that they can also, you know, go on and achieve what they want to do, work in finance, work in tech, or whatever it might be. What's, what's, what's the future of Cable look like? <laughs> uh hopefully long and, and large um <laughs> right now it's uh we're going through a very interesting transition period after we raised our series a we've been bringing on some um more senior talent into the team so we've hired a chief revenue officer uh we've got a head of ops and finance a head of marketing just started this week we're really sort of um bringing in a lot more firepower in areas that to date like honestly i was trying to cover with no background in these areas um, and the same on the product side with with Katie. And so uh, we're going through this transition period of how do we now incorporate these very senior leaders, these very experienced people into our culture? How do we keep running in the same direction? There's lots of really interesting things to think about and, and challenges to overcome with that. Um, and then really right now, I think the the timing for cable is pretty perfect. We are hearing so much noise that the regulators are requiring banks to automate their effectiveness testing. And as far as we can work out, we're the only people that are actually doing this today. So we are, uh, we're seeing strong pull from banks, particularly banks working with fintech programs. And so 
uh, a lot of the internal work that is the focus is how do we automate onboarding? How do we get all of these customers actually using cable and getting to value way more quickly? That's a that's a really interesting and difficult challenge for any tech company, how to um, speed up onboarding, especially when there are data integrations that have to be done. So that's a big focus. What What advice do you have to women who may be contemplating jumping into the CEO seat? I think I have two pieces of advice. The first is to really decide if you want to jump in, speak to other founders and try to ask them to tell you how how the bad days are, how the worst days are, because it. I think that being a founder is like being hit in the face every single day over and over again and then having to join calls and smile. Um, and it is very, very hard. And it is totally okay if that is not for everybody. And uh, you don't need to feel bad if you decide that actually that's not what you want. So my first piece of advice is to truly, truly understand what it is and what it would mean for you. Um, and then my second piece of advice is if you do do it, just never give up. I, and it's been said a lot that, you know, just you have to keep trying and persistence is key. And But that is, it is so true. You just have to never give up and you'll succeed if you just never give up. Just keep, keep going. That's great. Thanks for watching the show today. For more information, go to restive.com slash blog. Check out the show notes. And if you'd like to see future episodes, subscribe on YouTube. Thanks.